Good evening, and thank you for watching. My name is Hank Stevenson, and I'll be the moderator for this evening's debate. The Citizens Clean Elections Commission is the sponsor for this event. As a state's voter education agency, Clean Elections hosts debates so voters can have the opportunity to hear directly from the candidates, ask questions on the issues that matter most to them, and vote informed. Candidates that have a contested primary election have been invited to participate in the debate. Candidates that have opted into the Clean Elections Clean Funding Program are required to participate, while traditional candidates are invited and encouraged to attend. The questions that will be asked this evening are coming directly from voters. Leading up to the, the debates, Clean Elections conducted outreach to voters across the state, soliciting questions for candidates. Uh, voters that are watching this debate live, you can submit questions at any time. Do that by emailing debates at kc-a.com by texting 928-362-1062, or you can even call them in at 480-937-1297. Uh, specify if your question is for a specific candidate or for all candidates, please. We screen, screen questions for clarity to eliminate duplication, speeches, or personal attacks on candidates. This debate is scheduled for about an hour, hour and a half, so we may not get to all audience questions, but we will do our best. Candidates, you have one minute for your opening and closing statements and one to two minutes for your responses to voter questions. We encourage an open exchange of dialogue between the candidates. If you feel the need to respond to another candidate's comments, you may do so. I may limit responses for time management purposes, and we remind the candidates and the audience that this is a respectful, courteous, and professional environment. Our goal tonight is to connect candidates and voters so our electorate may vote informed. Uh, tonight's participants uh, for the legislative District 3 Democratic primary are uh, Representative Andres Cano, Representative Alma Hernandez, and Mr. Javier Soto. Um, Andres, Mr. Cano, will you start us off? Absolutely, and good evening, everyone watching home, uh, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Andres Cano, and I want to start off by thanking Hank and, of course, the Clean Elections Commission for hosting tonight's important forum. I can't believe it's been two years since I had a conversation with many of you about my interest in running for the State House. And here we are again, uh, almost uh, two years later. Uh, and I'm ready to continue fighting for Southern Arizona values at the state capitol. As your state representative, I've been proud to be able to uh, put a uh, focus on the important issues that will help lift up everyday Arizonans, including teachers, our health care, and uh, our education system. Uh, we need to continue to discuss these important issues at the legislature. And of course, tonight in this debate, I look forward to discussing how your legislature will help us uh, in the midst of a public health epidemic, of course, getting uh, on our feet again from COVID-19. Uh, my work is far from over at the state capitol. I'm committed to continuing uh, being one of your state representatives uh, up in Phoenix and representing you here uh, in Southern Arizona. So with that, Hank, I look forward to a robust discussion throughout today. Thank you. And let's, uh, let's move to Representative Fernandez next. Hello, good evening and buenas noches a todos. I really appreciate the time and opportunity to be able to join you all. I'm extremely honored to be one of the representatives of District 3, the district where I was born and raised. I'm very excited that I'm one of the members that serves in a committee that's probably one of the most important committees that we have at the legislature, and that is Health and Human Services. I'm extremely excited that every time when I step foot into that place, I'm able to work on legislation and bills that are helping improve our communities and pushing our agendas forward. So I'm very proud to be able to join you all as someone who has been a big supporter of those who have come before us. I'm excited to be able to continue the work that I've done at the Capitol. I'm very honored that in my freshman year, I was able to receive four awards for the work that I've done at the legislature. And I know as the only woman running and the only one with public health experience on this panel, I know that I will continue doing what we need to do to move our communities forward. So thank you, I appreciate it. And Mr. Soto, you're up next. Hello, everybody. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me here and for the invite uh, for this clean elections debate. Um, 
I don't know, a lot of people don't know much about me. I grew up here in Tucson, grew up on the south side of Tucson. I've been in construction my entire life. I've been uh, with the IBEW for the last 13 years as an electrician, journeyman wireman, and I've been an organizer for the IBEW for the past three years. Um, being involved in the, uh, as an organizer, uh, I kind of got thrown into the mix of meeting politicians and getting into the mix of local politics and uh, understanding what kind of legislature is being passed kind of led me to uh, understand that a lot of these uh, wor working families aren't being represented uh, at the table when it comes to the legislature that's being, the legislative laws that are being made that affect us. So that's one of the reasons why I decided to run. All right, well, and considering we're uh, hosting this via web conference, um, I think the proper place to start is kind of COVID related questions. So let's just jump into it. Um, Governor Doug Ducey allowed his stay at home order to expire on May 16th. Do you agree with this decision? Why or why not? And let's go in the same order. Thanks, Hank. Uh, I think the governor's premature decision to uh, open up our state again was absolutely a disastrous uh, policy and, and decision that ultimately uh, I hope we uh, are wrong in having to, to assess the impact of that decision. But look, for more than five weeks, Arizonans were uh, focused on taking care of their loved ones. They were focused on recovery and getting the resources that they need just to make ends meet. And for us to get into a situation where the governor uh, was suddenly going to erase all of that hard work. I mean, I don't know about the folks watching at home, but I had to take care of a nephew whose parents were uh, COVID positive. I had to grieve with my brother in the midst of him losing his father during the epidemic. I've been on the phone since day one, helping Arizonans reach the unemployment benefits that they work so hard for and they deserve. There is so much at stake and for the governor to unilaterally say we are going to open up again was absolutely a disastrous decision. And I think it's why when we came back last week at the state house to be able to address COVID-19 relief, the 29 house Democrats stood firm in saying, we want to work on legislation to address this public health epidemic. Now, it is our job in the minority to continue to hold folks accountable at the Capitol. I'm happy to be one of those members who's asking our governor to do better. I'm proud to be one of the legislators who's encouraging and, and pleading with the Republicans to realize that the reality they're seeing is much different from the one that I'm seeing every single day here uh, in Southern Arizona. Now, having said that, I do think uh, that we have to be able to sympathize and provide the type of support that we need to all of the small businesses and the folks who are eager to get back into our economy. Uh, and I think those resources uh, are, are um, we need more of them. And I wish that as uh, one of your 60 state representatives, we would have been able to have a more robust conversation about how we'll recover from COVID-19. I look forward to coming back in the summer or in the fall for a special session focused on this particular epidemic, because that's what Arizonans are waiting for right now. And I think it's a travesty that um, we're pretending that everything is business as usual in our state when uh, we've lost over 100,000 lives in the United States alone. So I look forward to continuing to hold this governor accountable. Uh, I hope he's listening. Uh, and uh, that's why I'm running for re-election, because our work is going to be focused in the next two years on how we rebuild our economy. And if I can very quickly, uh, Hank, uh, this epidemic showed us that Arizonans were just two or three paychecks, if not one paycheck away from not being able to pay the rent, to pay for the groceries, to pay for the health insurance. Um, and I, uh, I think it's important that we remember that particular uh, reality because uh, right before all of this, uh, we were being sold this fallacy that Arizona's economy was booming, that we were thriving, that it was the place to be. When um, you know what we have now are more than 500,000 unemployed Arizonans who can't even get through a service line to be able to get the unemployment benefits that they work so hard on. So our work is far from over, and I hope the governor's paying attention to uh, our input as lawmakers. And Representative Hernandez. Yes. So. Obviously, I feel that it was premature. We opened up the state, in my opinion, from a public health perspective, too soon. It is, you know, it, it's a part of being able to work in the legislature and also be a part of regular society. We're also human. I am unfortunately stuck in Phoenix for the next few days, 
We were up at the Capitol until Thursday. My father is vulnerable. He's on oxygen and I can't go home, unfortunately, because of this. If I were to go home and get him sick, because we have many members of the legislature who feel that this is a liberal conspiracy or that this COVID pandemic isn't real, I could, I could lose a loved one, which is why I have not gone home. And it's very frustrating because I want nothing more than to be able to sleep in my own bed and be home. But because of the circumstances that we're under, it's very difficult to do that. You know, it, there's been a lot of things that have gone on in the last several weeks. I, I sympathize with those business owners who are ready and want to open up their businesses. Many of those Hispanic owned businesses in our community and LD3 specifically, who have poured their entire life savings and life into starting their business who have at this point lost everything and who don't know if they'll be able to recover from this or they don't know if they'll be able to open up again. I, I sympathize with them, but at the end of the day, we have to be able to put the people in our communities before the profit that, that corporations are making, quite frankly. And when we have individuals coming from our community who are brown, who are black, who are native, who are our essential workers and are on the line every single day, but yet we don't have any any executive orders in the state that are protecting them, it's frustrating. So I think that it was done too early, too soon. Um, I, I hope that we don't have you know a significant spike in numbers come up again because of this. However, it's it's public health, and it's when we talk about the numbers and the rates that we're going to probably see because of this. You know, just a week ago we saw pictures of of folks out in Tempe partying, and the clubs have the bars have opened, and they're out there living a great life, I'm sure, but at the end of the day, it's not about individual risk and it's about the risk that we're putting others in. So in, in short, it, it was too soon in my opinion and we have a lot of work to do, which is why I know when we come back for a special session, we're going to have to address a lot of the issues that we face due to opening up too soon. Mr. Sota, too soon? Yes, absolutely. I, I do believe that they opened up too soon, especially uh, without setting any kind of safety standards for working people or or the uh, uh, people that visit these establishments. Um, they should have been able to uh, set some kind of safety standards for reopening for all businesses. Uh, people are under the, the impression that this this, uh, pan this this virus has gone away and they're acting like it's not there. And without safety standards in place, People are under the impression that they're that that it, that this virus has went away. So I definitely think that uh, that needs to be addressed. Well, and I want to talk a little bit about those safety standards. Um, the city of Tucson uh, went, or I'm sorry, Pima County went above and beyond um, the kind of guidelines that the governor had set, um, setting hard uh, capacity limits on restaurants, for example. Uh, urging, re forcing restaurants um, or requiring restaurants before they walk this policy back to post cleaning logs. Um, a lot of things that the restaurants said were onerous regulations on them. Uh, I guess the question is, did the city of Tucson um, go too far? And should the state be following the city's lead? No, I, I don't... I was going to say, I don't think the state, uh, the city of Tucson went too far. Quite honestly, I think they, they did what they needed to do. And we're very fortunate to have powerful uh, women who are our mayors across the state of Arizona, especially in the city of Tucson. She took the steps that the measures that were needed when it comes to public health. And I, and I stand by her 100% on those, because if we wouldn't have taken those precautions early on, we would have seen more folks in our community suffer from this. If you look at the zip codes who have been affected the most, it's zip codes in our, in our backyard, in our community, where we have Hispanic and Latinos who are low income. There is a nursing home called Sapphire just right outside of the line of our district in, in, this, in the part of South Tucson that has had some of the highest rates of individuals who have been infected by COVID. So uh, quite honestly, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I'm glad she did that. I think it was a great thing to do. It wasn't premature. And I think the state should have closed down a lot sooner. And I think this is something that Representative Cano can agree with is as legislators, we have been calling for that for a while, but we don't make those decisions. Those decisions come from the top, but we were definitely asking for that and, and it wasn't done too soon. Mr. Soto? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, what the city has done and what, what the county is trying to do is, is create these safety standards where the governor had failed. 
and, and I, I totally agree with the safety standards that they have. I visited a couple of uh, places to pick up some food, and I did see quite a bit of social distancing inside uh, uh, these restaurants picking up when I'm in there picking up food, and I totally agree with that. Well, Hank, uh, you know, I think there's something wrong with the picture when in Arizona, our lawmakers at the state capitol have no problem with local jurisdictions adopting sanctuary free cities for gun owners. But when we're talking about a public health epidemic and trying to protect and save lives, uh, not only in southern Arizona, but throughout the state, legislators suddenly have a problem with it and want to uh, criticize and, and frankly, fiscally harm local jurisdictions taking public health uh, at the forefront of their priorities. I applaud Mayor Romero. I applaud Mayor Gallego in Phoenix, Mayor uh, Evans and Flagstaff for being able to be bold and not to try to make a political issue out of COVID-19, but to say we are going to use our jurisdiction to protect the people in our respective cities. That is bold leadership. And I'm also very proud of the LD3 business owners who throughout the beginning of the epidemic and even after the governor's reopening were uh, champions for saying it is too soon for us to get back. And, you know, having uh, ordered takeout as well over these past couple of days as we've tried to wake up to a new reality, I want to stand with all of the small business owners who are taking this very, very seriously. Uh, and, and, you know, in the midst of all of this, I want to thank our local jurisdictions, but I also, in uh, tonight's debate, cannot possibly move forward without remembering the legacy of Chairman Supervisor Richard Elias of the County Board of Supervisors, who, of course, lost his life in late March uh, and whose uh, vision is a part of my vision at the state capitol. But lawmakers who are working time and time again, left and right in the middle of this, like Chairman Elias, to really be at the forefront of this and remind the governor that there is another world outside of 1700 West Washington, the state capitol. Um, and so uh, I applaud and join my colleagues tonight in saying thank you to those local leaders for leading the way. We got a question here from the audience, <clears throat> digital as it is. Um, with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen just how inadequate and archaic our state's unemployment system is. What can be done to better Arizona unemployment benefits? And I'll add to that, uh, before this pandemic hit and the federal government started kicking in $600 a week, our unemployment benefits in this state were maxed out at $240. Should we, as a state, go in once these federal, uh, once these federal unemployment benefits expire and uh, increase that to the, to the 840 that it is now? Absolutely. I don't know anyone really in our communities who could live off of just $240, $240 a week it is upsetting that these are hardworking folks who are depending and waiting on us as a state to be able to provide them with these resources. Expecting someone who has a family of four or five children or a, a larger family to live off of that minimal amount is, is, is ridiculous. And I think we need to do a better job as a state and in the legislature. And once this all settles down and COVID, hopefully we see a time where we are able to start moving towards a, a life that is more normal, we need to do what we can, hopefully when Democrats take the majority, to be able to put in more money for unemployment. We can't expect folks to live a life under those circumstances and only give them the minimal amount. So I, whoever asked the question, I, I will continue to fight for that. And, and I'm sure my Democratic colleagues who have had this at the top of their agenda will continue to do so as well. Representative Gano. Thanks, Hank. Um, I'll tell you the hardest part over uh, the last seven weeks that we've been faced with COVID-19 in Arizona and, of course, throughout our country has been hearing those difficult phone calls from constituents, getting the dozens of emails of folks saying, I can't get through the system. Uh, it is unacceptable that our Department of Economic Security has uh, taken as long as they have, uh, sometimes upwards of six or seven weeks to be able to process some of these claims. And in uh, holding the hands of my constituents who have been calling asking for help, uh, it, it is clear that the technical aspect, the technical side of our unemployment system is uh, one of the most archaic, but most importantly, uh, is it needs a complete 
transformation for us to be able to get with the times, for us to be having constituents uh, fax and force them for up to two hours to sit at a FedEx trying to get through the DES line to fax a, uh, the paperwork necessary to get a paycheck, uh, that's unacceptable. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the amount. Can you survive on $960 a month with the unemployment benefits that are offered by uh, the state of Arizona right now? The second lowest rate in the nation? Absolutely not. We have to increase that amount. There's a simple way uh, to be able to do this, and it's to stand on the side of working Arizonans. And uh, last but not least, as it relates to this issue, uh, we have such an antiquated formula system for unemployment benefits that it incentivizes you to not get a second job, because if you get any income coming in, you won't get the full allocation of 240. Uh, I'm very proud of the folks over um, uh, uh, my professor from college, Professor David uh, Wells, uh, for being able to put forward a plan to legislators to say we can actually let folks continue to work and not have to worry about that cap that would ultimately affect them. So uh, it's, it's going to be a conversation that I hope we have in this special session. Uh, you can imagine uh, the difficulty it is to get to the majority to understand that there are working class families in Arizona who need the support, but I stand with my Democratic colleagues to be able to move this issue forward, to prioritize it, because that's what our constituents need us to do. And Mr. Soto, what can we do yeah. to improve unemployment, and should we pay for that full 840 as a state once the federal benefits uh, well, well, one thing's for sure is that $240 is not enough for anybody. I mean, even back when the uh, minimum wage was at $8.00, 40 cents an hour, that's not even enough to support somebody making that kind of money. So the unemployment has to show the growth of, 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 uh, of our state, you know, and, and show, show, show that the wages that, that we've been making over the years, you know, the interest that's been going up, uh, the, the, the check, the unemployment check has to show that uh, $840 is quite a bit of money, you know, for most people. A lot of people in Tucson don't even make that you know, with a regular job. So I feel like there's got to be some kind of give and take there where unemployment really needs to um, come up with the wages that we're making today. Well, and, and Hank, if I, if I might, uh, I know we're okay. going to have some interactive conversation tonight, so I just have to add, um, you know, I, I think it's also a travesty where you have some of our colleagues up at the state capitol, especially on the majority side, criticizing the additional $600 a month at the federal government a uh, week federal government chipped in as part of the CARES Act, uh, we would have a completely different economic landscape in front of us if the federal government did not come in to provide uh, that assistance. And, uh, and I, I just, uh, you know, bring it on is what I say to my colleagues when they say that our, our constituents don't uh, deserve a little bit more resources to get by. Um, and, and I just thought that that was an important part of this uh, discussion. And I just want to add one thing. Uh, Mr. Soto just mentioned that that's that's more that's more than most people make in our district, and and it, it possibly is because most of the people in our district live at or below poverty. Depending on what part of the district you're in, we serve one of the most diverse districts where you have folks who are thriving, doing really well, and then you have those who are not doing well, and they would need the extra support. When we have senators who have said that. Um, this money that we're giving these lazy people, we just need to get back to work and open up again so we stop giving them these handouts. It, it, it just shows you what type of environment and political environment we're in right now, where we have the left who is saying it's not enough, and we have the right that is saying there's too much money going to these folks. So it is, it is unfortunate, the situation and the political games that are being played right now, but we're talking about people's lives. I had one constituent who I spoke to um, last night, actually. She was evicted from her home and is living out of a motel with her children. And that breaks my heart because knowing that these children are now in a very, uh, un I don't know how to put this, but in a very difficult situation to be in and they're small children living from motel to motel because they were evicted because they could not pay the, the mortgage it is, is beyond my comprehension, how we're putting children in these situations, how there's folks who have applied for unemployment and have been six to eight weeks with zero pay, absolutely nothing, and they have not been able to receive a call back or an email back from the department. It's frustrating. There are folks who, yes, they will get that small amount, but at the end of the day, they've lived, they've managed to be able to survive these last four to six weeks without zero. So it is something we need to look into and we need to continue working towards fixing.
And I've got three questions on this so far. So let's, uh, let's get this one out of the way. Uh, this is for both the lawmakers. Did either of you uh, hire, cause to be hired, uh, a lawyer to challenge Mr. Soto's petitions, uh, nominating petitions? And if so, why? I'll start off. Absolutely not. I have raised money for my campaign and I will be using that money to help me directly. And let me amend that. Did you order supporters or ask supporters uh, to file a lawsuit? I did not coordinate with anyone. Nope. Hank, uh, I'm proud that we have three candidates here uh, debating two open seats in the 2020 election. And of course, uh, I, as a party not involved in that particular situation, uh, absolutely not. I was not involved in a legal challenge to get any person on this uh, virtual stage tonight off the ballot. Okay. Um, so for all three, uh, will you be asking your volunteers to canvas door to door and speak to voters? And if so, how do you ensure their safety? Not only their safety, I guess, but the safety of voters whose doors they're knocking on. Hank, if you don't mind, when you're asking the questions, can you facilitate to ask like who and who's starting? That way we don't have it be so. I think sure. you said just to jump up. Yeah, whatever works. You if wanted us to jump in? Jump I in, go sure. ahead. Otherwise, I'll start calling okay. people. <laughs> okay. And let's well, start with first Kano. and foremost. <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> Since he asked for it, we'll have him. Well, I don't think that um, I'll, I'll be having volunteers go door to door at all. I mean, if we're going to do some kind of canvassing and maybe uh, dropping leaflets at, at, at the door, you know, hanging them on the doors. But, you know, it's going to be very difficult to really get that connection with the voters without being able to go door to door. Uh, so things are going to be uh, a little bit different, you know, as far as communicating with with the voters, uh, with, 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 with flyers, mailers and, you know, uh, platforms like like these debates i think it would be completely irresponsible for any candidate to send out canvassers at this time you know i i will focus my entire campaign has now shifted we've gone virtual phone banking and we're connecting with the voters i have no issue with that but as a public health person me having to send folks out to knock on the door absolutely not if anything, we will be dropping off literature, but that won't require someone knocking on someone's door or face to face. So I, I wouldn't put my volunteers or my interns at risk by doing that. Um, and I and I would ask that anyone who who is running that they reconsider because most of the folks that we're talking to, especially the good voters in our district, are elderly, and those are the most vulnerable folks, and we cannot put them at risk for a vote. Thank you. This has absolutely, uh, COVID-19 has transformed uh, elections. And I think ultimately I uh, am proud to be one uh, Democratic candidate who is absolutely committed to protecting the constituents that I was elected not only to represent, but that I am asking for a second term in the state house. Uh, I think there is a way that we can still engage folks in the political process. Part of the reason why I ran for office was to be able to get everyday Arizonans engaged in the political process to get young people, to get women, to get seniors, to get everybody in the spectrum uh, to participate. And there's a way to do that. Uh, you can contact voters, uh, your neighbors. You can do it by phone. You can do it by email. I've seen some of our volunteers get very creative about uh, the plans that they have for uh, a, a, a very um, uh, it's going to be a completely different new landscape uh, in, in this summer leading up to August and into the November elections. But uh, my campaign will not be knocking door to door. Uh, I think uh, we will uh, certainly be paying attention to all of the data that we have uh, to be able to assess what's going to make most sense. But, you know, for some of the campaigns uh, that I'm in contact with right now, I mean, folks are not opening the door right now. Um, and, and, and I think that is uh, a, a good reminder of Southern Arizona being good stewards of uh, the people right next to us because they're taking this seriously while you have, uh, as was mentioned earlier, those uh, images that we're seeing throughout our state of folks pretending as though we never went through this epidemic. And more than anything, um, the epidemic is still alive. We've not talked about the Navajo Nation tonight and the 
tremendous uh, help and support that we continue to need to send up north in our state uh, for an indigenous community, uh, a native community that now has more infections of COVID-19 uh, and more lives affected than the state of New York. And can I add just one quick thing to that, um, Hank, sorry. But what, one of the things that we do know is that it, it, this is a pandemic um, and we don't know what it's going to look like in the next two, three weeks. Obviously we have medical professionals, researchers, evidence-based research that is showing us that over time we're going to probably see an, an uptick in cases because things are starting to open up. We don't know what Arizona is going to look like in the next few weeks. So we can't really plan around. It's very difficult to plan around something when we don't know the outcomes. We don't know what that's going to look like. So I just want to make sure that those folks who are watching understand that we have the data, we have the numbers that we have in front of us, but that does not, that does not indicate, that's not an indicator of what is going to happen in the next few weeks, especially now that the governor has opened up. We're probably, you know, I hope not, but we're probably going to see more rates where we, we upped the number of test kits. So now that we're testing more, you'll see more cases and that's how that works. So I just want folks that are sitting at home to understand that part. And so you all, the three of you agree that your campaigns, at least right now, will not be going door to door, will not be engaging with voters on a face to face level. There are several uh, progressive in citizens initiatives that are still working to make the ballot, to collect enough signatures to qualify for the ballot. So those initiatives also stop going door to door, also stop engaging with voters right now. I think there's several ways to do it. And I think some of them have taken a really great um, stance on this. And they're actually asking their supporters to take petitions and get them, you know, leave them at their, I've seen pictures of folks in my district who are putting up a table outside of their home and asking people to come and sign with their own pen. They're taking the right precautions and measures. I don't think that it's smart and it's the right thing to do to put people at risk and go door to door knocking for those signatures. I think there are other ways to do this where you can be creative and innovative and also still be able to collect those signatures. So, you know, if they are doing it, I would highly suggest during the situation that we're in not to, but also reaching out. There are many elected officials. I know my brother is going to drive up to Nogales um, tomorrow or on Thursday and collect signatures doing the same way that everyone else is doing on a table and not going door to door. So there's ways to do it where you can still um, get collect those signatures. Representative Cano. I'm really inspired by the mobilization that's coming out of legislative district three constituents, uh, public education supporters who want to see the invest in education proposition, the healthcare rising proposition, uh, good candidates on the ballot in the November election for some of the school board races. And they're doing it in the most creative ways. Uh, I, I think one of the uh, best ways that we saw this happen in Tucson kind of coming together in the midst of an epidemic and making public health a priority was the campaign of uh, Adelita Grijalva, who's running for Pima County Supervisor District 5 race and happy to support her campaign. But she got 1,500 signatures in a week by being able to do all of the public health precautions that have been uh, furthered by public health professionals, the sanitizing, the social distancing, and people came together to support that campaign and to support uh, the campaign moving forward, as I mentioned, Invest in Ed, uh, Healthcare Rising, because they want to continue to participate. Uh, I encourage you to reach out to uh, my campaign at andresforarizona.com to ask about the ways that you can continue being a part from uh, of this campaign, of this journey uh, to the state house and of changing our state by um, taking care of yourself first and more importantly getting engaged we cannot sit silent and i know that that's part of the energy that's driving so much of the mobilization right now is that while we can't do things in the traditional way there are people who want to give back and they're eager and ready to give back so again on andresforarizona.com we have a campaign and several of them waiting for you and mr soto considering your campaign isn't going door to door should these uh initiatives also um scale back their um they're canvassing? Well, some of the ideas, uh, like these people that are setting up a booth in front of, in front of their house and having people sign and, and cleaning the pens and, and not reusing them and stuff like that with the social distancing and just getting people to sign these petitions is, is a pretty good idea. But ultimately, uh, it's going to be very difficult to get all of the signatures for these initiatives to be put on, 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 on the, uh, the elections. Um, 
one of the things that that I, I think should happen is uh, these uh, petitions should be able to be signed just like we did for our uh, for ourselves, you know, the uh, um, online petition signing with the equal, you know, I, I would think that, you know, in a times like this, that there, people should be able to go online and sign a petition to get an initiative, uh, you know, uh, uh, out there. Well, and if I could just add, as it relates to the equal system and uh, the ability to collect signatures online for uh, for citizen-driven initiatives, just like we do in, in partisan races, like the ones that uh, we all had the three candidates on this call tonight. I mean, look, we already should have a Secretary of State's office. Unfortunately, under Secretary Reagan, that uh, that initiative was not followed through to make this uh, online uh, s s uh, signature submission possible. Uh, but I want to remind the folks watching at home that the reason why we can continue to ask for a different legislature, a different governor, and uh, a more engaged citizenry is that when the initiative peti uh, petitioners went to the Supreme Court and said, can we please use this system that already exists in the middle of a pandemic to help uh, put these initiatives on the ballot, the Arizona Supreme Court said no. Uh, let us remind ourselves that this governor has appointed more justices, uh, not only on the Supreme Court, but for all the municipal uh, superior courts as well than any other governor in history. This is the impact of elections and why we continue to encourage each and every single one of you to participate in the political process in off years and in on presidential years, like the ones that we are in right now, because every election has consequences. And I'm so upset that we were not able to get the Supreme Court to allow these citizen-driven initiatives to be uh, gathered signatures online uh, in this public health epidemic. Neither the Supreme Court nor the federal district court. Yeah. Um, so here's another one from the audience. Uh, they phrase it as when Democrats win the legislative majority this November, uh, what will your top three issues to tackle be? And let's start with uh, Representative Hernandez. Yes. So first and foremost, I think we will take the majority. And that that is something that I know that the majority of Arizona is ready for. And I'm looking forward to the day where we take the majority and we're able to work with folks and actually create change. Most most folks um, from the outside think that it's very easy just to sponsor a bill, get it through. It doesn't work that way. And that's not the reality of the legislature. Things would be much more different right now if we were in the majority. So just a perfect example, this week, I or well, yeah, today, actually, one of my bills died in the Senate, which, which was a little sad because I don't think anyone wants their bills to die. But I was very proud to be able to push this legislation on behalf of the Holocaust survivors who some are watching right now. Thank you. Um, working with them to ensure that we're to, with the rise of anti-Semitism and hate and bigotry in our country, working on legislation that's going to teach the future generation to not do that. And that is the reason why I pushed so hard for the Holocaust education bill. I had 84 co-sponsors, which means overwhelmingly the majority, and thank you to my seatmate for signing, the majority of the legislature signed on to that bill, which was huge. You don't see that often where you have the majority of both sides signing on to legislation. So I will be bringing those bills back. This, this year alone, I, I sponsored seven bills. Out of the seven bills, four of my bills got out of committee, most of them unanimously, and two of them made it out to the Senate, and the other two were, were stuck in, in rules. So it, I'm very proud that as a freshman legislator, I was able to get four of my bills into committees and passed. That is huge, and I plan to do that again. But most importantly, what I want to do coming back, and hopefully we're able to address it in a special session, is addressing the real issue, which is those immigrants in our community who are currently not receiving any support whatsoever from our state. We have so many DACA and DAPA recipients who live in LD3, who are undocumented, living in the shadows, who have not been able to receive any support from our state, and that needs to change. I think we need to do a better job as a state to provide services for all Arizonans, regardless of their status. And that is something that I really want to work on because no person should be scared to go seek medical attention because of their status. 
So that's first and foremost, one of the issues I want to make sure that we're working on healthcare issues. When it comes to education, I want to make sure that we're, again, this past year, I was able to work with Governor Ducey and I got a million dollars in the budget as a freshman. That's, that's a big deal for me. A million dollars in a bipartisan way to train police officers. I'm sure many of you have seen what's been going around the country with people of color, especially blacks, all around the, the country who have been faced with police brutality. That for me, that is part of the reason why I ran for office the first time and why I'm going to continue the work that I've been working on and making sure that we're protecting the kids in our schools. And lastly, you know, there are many other things that people want jobs, people want to be able to get back to work after COVID, we're going to really see the effects and what's been going on in our communities. People want to be able to provide for their families. And I know that's going to be one of the top issues on my list to be able to come back and find ways for people to be able to survive. Anna? Thank you so much. You know, for me, my 2020 plan is going to be focused on supporting our education system, supporting our public education, uh, our educators, getting community colleges restored uh, in Arizona. The funding has been cut since 2015. The legislation that I've introduced for the last two years would have restored money to Pima and Maricopa Community Colleges. They're the only two community colleges who receive zero dollars in state support from the capital. Uh, I look forward to continuing to being an advocate for the environment and our natural resources as a member of the Natural Resources Committee. I think it is a crazy world for us to not be focused on uh, safeguarding our most precious resource, and that's water, uh, at a time when we are in a desert, when we have continued uh, water needs that need to be addressed. But there are so many special interests at the state capitol that don't allow us to get real about protecting uh, our air and our water. And last but not least, the economy. Uh, we want folks to have good paying jobs. We want them to have good benefits. And that's why I am union uh, endorsed. And so uh, to those watching at home, those are the three E's that I'm going to be stay focused on as your returning state representative, education, uh, the environment and the economy. And if I might, Hank, one thing that we have yet to talk about in depth, and I hope we can have a conversation about it uh, after this is our continued need to focus on criminal justice reform. I think that's directly related to the economy and uh, what we need to do to give folks a second chance because, as I've said on the campaign trail for now uh, more than two years, uh, it is a travesty when you can get locked up for four or five years in one of our state prisons for the equivalent of a sweet and low packet, um, and, and we have to address the real issues. If we want a strong economy, why do we have poverty? Why do we have substance abuse and mental health issues, and why aren't we doing anything to support local jurisdictions on the ground, you know, it was mentioned earlier that uh, there was only one candidate on uh, that has public health experience. Uh, I spent eight years working for Pima County and working hand in hand with our uh, department uh, here, our health department, to be able to address these very issues like neighborhood infrastructure, like our behavioral health pavilion that's one of the most uh, acclaimed behavioral health resources in the state of Arizona. Uh, and that's at University Medical Center South. Um, and so I, I want us to address a lot of these things. And, and I'll, su I'll summarize by saying that, you know, we have a lot of good ideas on the Democratic side at our state capitol. What is um, so disheartening is to see so many of those ideas not considered because of the party affiliation and, uh, of the current sitting members, 31 Republicans, 29 Democrats. When you have good bills that are dead on arrival, that are not heard in committee, uh, I'm proud to also have had one, of, uh, one bill heard in committee this year that passed unanimously. It was a bill to support our food banks. That went nowhere because of the D next to my name. Uh, and I'm looking forward to writing a bright new chapter for our state. Uh, our Arizonans watching back home are the ones that are gonna be responsible for that new day uh, on that uh, second Monday in January in 2021, uh, when we uh, say hello to a Democratic Speaker of the House. Mr. Soto, top three. Yeah, well, as times change, the priorities change, you know, so one of the things I really want to focus on is, you know, worker protections. You know, I've been in construction my, my entire life. Uh, we wear PPEs, hard hats, safety glasses. If we go into a dusty environment, we wear a dust mask. We, the employers provide all of these PPEs for us. And there's got to be, like I said, some sort of safety standards for people, especially in the restaurant business or in, in, in these stores like uh, 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 Costco or whatever, where there's a lot of people in there buying. There's got to be some kind of safety standards. Um, 
Another thing I'd like to concentrate on, of course, is education and not only funding for the teachers, but funding for counselors and, and expanding uh, more counselors per uh, student. Um, one of the other things I'd also like to concentrate on is the economy. We need better jobs here in Tucson, Arizona. You know, we got companies that are building billion dollar manufacturing plants in Phoenix, even in uh, uh, Coolidge. And these jobs, you know, we could have some of those types of projects here in Tucson, Arizona. And I just want to add one quick thing, um, Hank, because of the this the counselors that was just mentioned and putting more into our, our public education system. Last year, I worked hard with other colleagues to ensure that we put $20 million in so that we could be able to have more school resource officers and more school um, more school counselors. That, that thing is very important because that is the exact reason why I worked with the governor to ensure that if we are not going to be able to stop officers from being on school grounds, we need to invest more in having school counselors and also investing in training those officers to work with the children. So that is something that's been done this last session and I know we will continue to work towards. The goal is eventually not to have to have school resource officers on school campuses, but that was a start that we were able to work on last year. And I just wanted to mention that. All right, I'm gonna get down to a little bit of budget talk. Um, State budget analysts predict Arizona will have a $1 billion deficit because of the economic fallout of the uh, coronavirus lockdown. Um, I'm presuming because we're in a Democratic primary here uh, that um, cutting services will not be um, your go-to response. So what I want to know is, are you willing to raise taxes, which taxes, and by how much? And let's start with Mr. Soto. Well, that's a pretty tough question because if we're going to be looking at a deficit, um, it's going to be kind of hard to get some of the things that we want accomplished without having uh, some kind of income here, you know, within the next couple of years. Uh, there's a lot of companies that come down in, into to do business here to build these plants and they're getting these tax loopholes. They're, they're not paying their fair share of tax. And there's got to be something done to where this burden is not put on the working class. It's it's put more or less on some of these larger businesses that aren't paying any state taxes. And, and I'll just, oh, I was just gonna say, I, I, I believe and I strongly believe this, that in order for us to have a thriving education system, we have to be able to pay into this system when it comes to taxes. You know, at the end of the day, that is why I support Invest in Ed. Everyone has to pay their fair share and there are corporations that are here uh, all over the country, really, but also in Arizona, who are not paying what they should be paying. And we can't be able to have a productive society where people aren't being educated to the capacity that they should be because our education system is lacking. It's severely starved for years. We have not even gone back to where we were years ago. So, you know, I know a lot of folks don't like to hear that we want to raise taxes, but it has to be done in order to improve the current situation that we're in. I am a member of the House Ways and Means Committee, and that is the committee tasked with discussing our state's revenue. And it's a committee that I've had a lot of fun on with my Democratic colleagues over uh, the last year and a half, because what we've been able to do is to remind the Republican majority about what is possible in Arizona. We can have a robust K-12 education system that, fun that funds district additional assistance, that funds more counselors, that gets teachers to have more of the wage increase that they deserve to be able to fix the HVACs. Uh, that's all possible, but what is, uh, but it's not going to be possible if we continue passing our budget on the backs of hardworking Arizonans. Uh, in this same committee that I told you about, we time and time again, and especially even over the last year, have uh, in this last session uh, that started in January, we're passing left and right, these special tax credits and deductions. When you add them all up, when you add the more than 20 tax credits that exist, the different loopholes, the 500 plus uh, deductions that exist, you start to realize, and it's just like anybody at home, when you're putting your budget together, you're paying attention to what's coming in and what's going out. And there is so much less coming in 
and we continue to fail uh, to pay attention to these tax credits that ultimately uh, are hurting us. And, and it's I'm sure, and I've supported some of those uh, tax credits in my short term with all of you uh, as your state representative. But I'll tell you, uh, what I have not done is sign on to any tax credit that does not have any kind of accountability measures. If your hard-earned taxpayer dollars are being used to benefit a particular industry or to incentivize an employer to come here, there has to be a checks and balances. It's why I was proud to serve this past December on a joint review committee that actually got us for the first time in over five years to meet and review tax credits that were or perhaps not uh, benefiting the people of Arizona. That's the kind of conversation we have to have. Uh, and I was just glad to see us moving forward in that process that the joint committee uh, was moving forward. And you know, without getting too wonky here, it's the kind of, of conversation that we're gonna have to have if we want to be able to ensure that out of this relief that we're gonna be offering and the, the, the coming together uh, in a 2020 and 2021 cycle after a public health international epidemic, uh, I, I'm very much interested in looking at the existing breaks that are on the books right now and looking at which ones are best serving the people of Arizona. So I asked a pretty specific question there, and I don't think I got an answer. Does anyone want to try again? Hank, I think you did get an dollars. answer. Where is it coming it's from? An 11 billion What's your plan to get us a billion dollars? A billion dollars in the deficit is what you're saying. Uh, well, we, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll say you you know, this is this is a short term problem. So maybe we don't need to raise revenues a billion dollars, um, because presumably our economy should go back to about where it was before. But in the short term, we've got to come up with a billion dollars. So if it's not raising revenues, what is it? Well, I want us and I would assume that my Democratic colleagues on this uh, on this debate tonight would want us to bring in more than the billion dollar shortfall that we are going to have as a result of this epidemic. And I think, you know, if Hank, if, if the reason why we're supporting the investment in education uh, attacks on higher income Arizonans uh, who absolutely are able to afford this, that's why we've signed on to it. At least that's why I've signed on to it, because it's time that we start to pay our fair share and look equitably at what we're doing to support our education system. Now, what we've not talked about is the you know $12.3 billion budget that we passed last year that doesn't exist now. Now we have a billion dollars, but look at all the things we need. We have a healthcare system uh, that picks winners and losers. We have a transportation system that is tremendously antiquated and is going to need more revenue very soon to be able to address that. It's why I support the gas tax as do most of our jurisdictions throughout the state. Um, it, it's, it's not a, a one size all. And so I, I would just say, you know, what are the specific revenues that we're trying to replace? As it relates to COVID-19, absolutely. Let's look at all of these tax credits uh, to be able to assess how we can bring in more resources. Okay, I heard gas tax and invest in ed. You're off the hook. Mr. Soto? I would think that uh, short term, you're going to have to do something and find a way to raise this kind of revenue, uh, whether it's uh, requiring some of these new employers to have uh, um, wage, uh, uh, minimum uh, wage uh, uh, for, for their workers. I'm not talking about minimum wage, but a, a minimum wage level for people in these plants. You, you know what I'm saying? So uh, there's got to be a way to raise that money short term. And I would say, uh, yeah. Representative Hernandez. Hi, yeah. So first and foremost, I don't have the numbers cracked down or anything like that. If that's what they're, tr if they're trying to get a full number, I don't have that. And I think that would take a little time for all of us to be able to figure out. But I do, I do believe and I strongly feel that we need to modernize POP 301. You know, we continue to hit education. Educa education has continued to be hit the hardest out of, anything really. And if we really want to do this, we have to push it up to a penny. I don't understand why we are not at a penny yet. That would really help us tremendously. So modernizing POP 301 would be a great start for us to be able to bump that up to a full penny and be able to make some revenue that way. So, you know, it's it's a sales tax. And, and you know, a lot of folks don't want to hear that. But at the end of the day, if we want to save education and we want to be able to properly fund our education system, we have to do it. Can I do that? Um, if we don't do something like that, education is probably going to be one of the first things that's going to be uh, off the table as, as far as far as funding goes. 
they're probably going to start, you know, uh, use a lot of this revenue for roads and infrastructure and working people and, and educators are going to be the ones to take the hit. You know, and, and Hank, while we're on the subject, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've gone into rooms with business leaders, with community organizations, when they're saying, please invest in our K-12 system because we're losing employers uh, in Arizona. They're going to other states where their legislatures and their governors actually do invest in a quality K-12 system. I told you about workforce development and community colleges when we don't even fund the two largest community colleges uh, in our state to be able to train and prepare our workforce for uh, today and tomorrow's economy. That's a travesty. Um, and, and last but not least, as it relates to our uh, burgeoning uh, transportation system and, and the ways that we can get smarter about commuting and 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 um, you know trying to bring in additional revenue to address the shortfall that we have in front of us with the Department of Transportation, uh, you know, robbing from Peter to pay Paul to fund our Department of Highway Safety. Just for example, uh, for an example, Hank, Representative Hernandez and I weren't even born yet the last time that the gas tax was uh, was was looked at, and so. You know, it, it, it's time for us to have a, a across the board conversation about all of this. And, and I'm sick and tired of, you know, putting together the governor, putting together these roundtables to say, what do you think we should do? And, you know, as was just mentioned, we have to beg for a quarter of a penny, a, a, for a half of a penny, for a penny. Um, I just think our, our students deserve more uh, and, and our, our and public educators deserve uh, a lot more resources right now. And, and um, it's no surprise that Arizona is at the bottom of our list again in supporting uh, our teachers. And I'll just add one quick thing to the education part. So I'm very proud to be a professor at Arizona State University. I, I love what I do. I love my job. But we also have to acknowledge that just a few weeks ago, we are the only state during the pandemic who cut funding to our universities and colleges. Like the, the fact that the state of Arizona during this, this horrible crisis is the only state who did that it is just appalling. And we should all be very concerned about that because if we are not, first of all, these universities, ASU, NAU, U of A, have been tremendous partners in really helping us with the entire COVID situation, whether it's research, whether it's funding for programs, it, it, they are a big part of what is keeping our state going, yet we voted, not we, because I didn't vote for that, but we voted to be able to cut the funding that they're already receiving when they don't receive enough. So I just wanted folks to know that, that we're one of, we're actually the only state that I know of right now during a pandemic who has cut the, the funding to our universities. And it, it's just, if we were to actually fund them properly, can you imagine the work that they would be able to contribute to our state and help us with this pandemic. And we were actually able to provide them the resources they need to keep going. You know, it, it's it's something that we need to start talking about and thinking about as we move forward. And I got a couple of university questions I wanna to get to, but I wanna ask this one first from the audience. Um, do all the candidates endorse increasing the minimum wage? And I'll add to that, let's just do a quick yes, no, and how much? Starting with whoever's yes. <laughs> and how much? Yes, I think we need to get to the fifteen dollars. I think it's it, we're we're late. We're behind. We need to hurry up and be able to pay the folks in our communities what they deserve to be paid. I'd say yes, definitely. Fifteen dollars an hour sounds pretty reasonable. You give these people more money. Uh, that's more taxable revenue that goes to the state, and that gives more buying power. So they they put that money right back into the city, which goes right back you know, into our state. So definitely $15 an hour sounds good to me. Uh, absolutely in agreement, uh, 15 an hour at minimum. Uh, and I think ultimately we have to be, you wanted yes and no's, right? So I won't. You, I won't well, I'll take a little bit more if you've got it. <laughs> well, I was just gonna say, you know, when we have, um, when, when we have the service industry, right, affected by this COVID-19 epidemic, and you have, uh, you know, a, a tip-based economy, when you have folks who um, are are getting $10 an hour jobs, I mean, it, it has been one of the most frustrating things as a member of your legislature, as one of your incumbent representatives, to have to hear these passive-aggressive comments about the citizen-driven initiative to pass the proposition that got us to uh, be able to provide a semi-living wage in Arizona. That was people coming together and saying we are going to take care of one another uh, and for it to somehow be called um, you know a, a job killer rather than a job creator uh, which is what I've heard for the last year and a half I mean I just um, 
I have to remind folks of, uh, in, in, you know, who operate in this bubble, that there are folks who actually benefit from uh, fair wages, from a living wage, and from benefits. And, and so District 3 includes the University of Arizona. What do you guys think about the U of A's plan to reopen in fall? I, and I'll say because I've been on a lot of calls within our universities and those folks who run them. And it, it's difficult, again, to be able to plan around. It's hard to put a plan in place when we don't know what's going to happen in the next few weeks. I do want to say that I know they are working extremely hard and they have some very amazing people on their staff who are doing everything that they can to keep folks still learning and also keep it being a safe environment. I know that the university doesn't want to open up, especially as they're connected with Banner, and that's where a lot of our patients in our district go. They don't want to open up and just cause a, a complete dent within our in our healthcare system. But I know that they also are realistic that they do eventually have to open up, but they hopefully will be able to take the precautions that are necessary to keep people safe in our communities. So I, I if they are saying that in fall, they project that they'll be able to follow CDC guidelines and do that, whether it's doing classes via Zoom, which is how I've been able to do most of my classes at ASU. Um, you know, there's ways to do it where you don't have to pack up a, a room with over 100 students. Mr. Sika? Yeah, I, I think that uh, it's okay for them, them to plan on everything being okay by the fall, but they should really have a plan B. You know, if things don't pan out, if, if the rates start, the COVID uh, uh, infections start going up, and they're not going to be able to uh, have a regular schedule, then they're going to have to have a plan B in doing online classes. And uh, it's going to be, have to be the way it's going to be. Hank, I don't have much to add from what my colleagues have, have said, other than to say that, that I absolutely trust in President Robbins making the appropriate dis decision to protect folks. And, and you know, outside of that, uh, along with our, our other uh, two state universities, I was on a call with uh, President Crow from Arizona State, who uh, has talked uh, very openly about how this epidemic, as difficult as it's been, has made us uh, be able to work uh, in, in, a, in a new way, perhaps, that, that is more effective. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but the Tempe area, because of the Arizona State University, is one of the top 10 Zoom users in the entire world. Of course, you have, you know, a, a big student body that contributes to that, but, but I think we're going to get smarter, we're going to get more resilient, and I hope uh, that our university partners continue to pay attention to the public health data available. I know that they will. Uh, but ultimately, those decisions, um, you know, we have to remember the moment that we're in right now, which is why we're continuing to, uh, you know, preach with our constituents. Um, please take care of yourselves during these times so that we don't have another rebound. I just want to add one quick thing because I truly acknowledge and I and I and I truly feel the pain of those gr recent graduates who didn't have a normal graduation like I was very blessed to be able to have. I, I, I feel and I see and I've read so many messages of family members who it was their first to first in the family to graduate and they weren't able to have that experience that many members in my family had to be able to watch them walk down the, the, the hall and get their certificate. I, I completely feel it and, I, and I'm so sorry to all those graduates, whether you're at University of Arizona, Arizona State, Arizona State University, at Grand Canyon, whatever university you're a part of, I, I truly just want to congratulate all of those who are hopefully going to be able to go on and do great things for our state. But I, I do acknowledge that those precautions were taken because they were needed to be taken. So I, I just want to just to mention that because I know so many folks have been so upset about not being able to have a regular graduation like many of us have. And I, got a, I got a question from the audience I really like, but I want to I stick to the uh, higher education uh, theme here. Do you support enabling the community colleges to award four-year degrees? And let's start with uh, Representative Kano. Thank you, Hank. Uh, I oppose uh, that legislation uh, in the process that we saw earlier this year, and I'll tell you why. 
Uh, for me, I, I want us to be able to have a robust discussion about how we are going to be supporting all of the existing higher education institutions throughout our state, starting from Pima Community College to Maricopa Community College to our three state universities. I want us to uh, take a step back and remind ourselves of the state of higher education in Arizona. When you look at how much our state spends and the whole pie, right, of an $11 billion skinny budget as we passed this year, you have education at the top, you have healthcare as the second line item, and then the third in line uh, are, is the Department of Corrections. Right below that is our university system. Uh, I heard arguments uh, from all sides about these four-year proposal to be able to encourage uh, a partnership, to be able to get more students in the pipeline, to have a lower uh, cost, more affordable, um, transition from the community college system to the state system. I truly, in my heart, believe that that system already exists. What we are continuing to try to do is to distract the folks back home from the real issue, which is we spend more on prisons than we do on our three state universities combined in Arizona. And so until we're ready to have a robust conversation about the realities of today, how it is becoming more and more less affordable for students to go to college and finish college when you have fee after fee tacked on when textbooks are a hundred dollars and used once throughout an entire semester those are the kind of conversations i expect of our board of regents not lawmakers to come up with proposals that allegedly increase access when i want to have another conversation so no hank and i'll and i'll just add to that you know i I strongly feel that whenever we vote, we vote on the entire state of Arizona. When we're casting our vote, it doesn't just go in and, and favor the people in LD3, it goes to the entire state. So when we're looking at things like expanding access to higher education, it's very important that we think about those communities who are in rural communities, who are in communities that are not having so many folks go to college. So I really support encouraging all of those who want to go to college because I am very aware of college isn't for everyone. But for those who do want to go to the college and receive a degree, or whether it's a technical school, whatever it is, I encourage them and I want to support their efforts. So if that means that we have to come up with innovative ways to be able to do that, you know, I support everyone being able to have access. Um, with that being said, you know, recently we just voted on a bill to expand broadband connection to some, to some uh, rural areas in Arizona, especially on the Navajo Nation. And one thing I want to mention is it, it's a true travesty and it's just very disheartening to know that in our own backyard, the Navajo Nation, there are areas there that still have no running water, no connectivity. I was just on a call with President Nez um, two days ago, no, on Thursday of last week, he joined me for a webinar that I was doing for the class that I'm teaching to talk about the issues that they're facing on the Navajo Nation. And just to even get him onto the call was just, you know, really difficult to do. So that just shows some of the challenges that folks are facing in rural communities and in tribal communities. And I want people to acknowledge that it, and anytime we vote on something, it affects everyone in the state of Arizona. So remind, remind me, I'm sorry, did that one make it to the House floor? And if so, how did you vote? Yes, and I voted for it. Okay. And Mr. Soto, your thoughts? Well, that, that's a tricky question. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's in our uh, state's constitu constitution that universities should be free. Uh, I don't know if many people know that. But um, I think community colleges, I think that, that uh, students should be able to go to school for free and get an at least associate's degree. As nearly free as possible. Absolutely. Constitutional yes. provision. So open to interpretation, eh? Yes. <laughs> um, all right. There's one from the audience that I really liked. Um, and this one's just for the lawmakers. Um, but tell us about a constituent that you helped with a state issue in these last two years. I, I don't know where to start. Never. I think... I think, you know, Representative Hernandez and I are looking at each other because because really, I think the last week, um, uh, the, the last month, rather, has been the most blatant example of, of all of this. I mean, for me, uh, 
when this epidemic started, it was clear that this legislature, this part-time legislature was going to become a full-time position, a full-time job, uh, as it should. But uh, more than anything, uh, it, it's because folks were needing help. Um, and, you know, there uh, was one constituent who I was really proud of um, because in the midst of the epidemic, you know, when my office was getting phone calls saying, uh, you know, we can't reach the, uh, the unemployment line, we can't get a hold of anyone, nobody's answering the phone, uh, it, what you were talking about at that point was about a three or four week delay in people getting any single dollar, right? This is this is early April. And so my assistant and I were like, well, what do we have to do to be able to support folks? And so we raised some money. We raised about $3,500 to get groceries for folks in the district as they're waiting for unemployment benefits. Uh, and you know, that to me was community coming together. We had over 80 donors that were able to support grocery shopping to support now more than 14 families and more than 3,000 in expenses to support our union grocery stores and get that support to folks. And I'll tell you, just to wrap up, one of those same folks who called my office was a gal uh, named Sabrina. And Sabrina said, I, I don't know what to do. My son and I are both unemployed and it's been seven weeks. This is last week. And I said, well, is there anything we can do immediately to help you? And she said, yes. And she said, I need food and was in tears. This is the kind of reality that we continue to try to get our folks across the aisle at the Capitol to understand, right? And, you know, for me, I don't do this for personal gain. I don't do it because there is a benefit to it. It's because when there is a need, lawmakers need to be able to be there and support their, their constituents. And, and Sabrina, as of Thursday, got all of her back pay in the unemployment benefits that she worked so hard for and had to wait so patiently for. And there's a handful. I have a spreadsheet of all of the folks who are in that similar situation. Um, and I'm just really proud to be them, be, uh, to be there for them because now more than ever, this is the campaign, right? This is our ability to demonstrate the kind of representative we're going to be fighting for folks in our district. And there's lots of stories, but, uh, and I'm sure Ms. Hernandez will have several as well, uh, because it's been a full-time position, uh, truly, and uh, especially in this public health epidemic. And I'll just add, you know, there are so many different situations that I could, I, I don't even know where to begin with this, because since all of this began, I really, and I know a lot of my colleagues have been doing the same, working extremely hard, whether we're calling the director of DES directly and saying, please help me follow up with this. I think they hate me right now because of all the requests, but it's our job. And I want people to know that it's okay to reach out to us. That is why we were elected to serve them, to be able to help in any way possible. And if someone tells you they can't help you, they're lying to you because there is always something that we could do. And I will tell you, I mean, the, the amount of messages and emails and calls and even Facebook, Twitter, every method you could think of people have contacted trying to receive help on their situation. Folks that didn't even know they qualified for assistance have reached out and I've been able to connect them to the right folks. So I'm really proud of that work because it's around the clock, it continues, it hasn't stopped. I don't anticipate that it's going to stop at the end of the week. You know, I think over time we're going to see a decrease a bit, but we're, we're in a situation where people need help now and people need us to act and do what we can in order to help them feed their families, pay their rent, um, get a job. You know, I had one constituent who reached out who didn't have access to the internet. Her internet was cut off. She lives downtown, was really struggling. And she messaged me and we were talking and I told her, is it okay if I call the folks over at Cox? And guess what? Within the next hour, Cox was out there at her site and were able to reconnect her. She needed to be reconnected to be able to communicate with the outside world. She, had, she was handicapped and elderly. And for her, having that internet access was life-changing. She was very excited to be able to, she actually called me on her, the Wi-Fi and said, my internet's working again. And I was really, really excited about that because these are situations that you don't always hear of, but they're definitely happening in our community. And I just want folks who are watching, if there is something we could help you with, always feel free to reach out to our office. I did send out a call not long ago to all of the constituents in my district offering resources and help. And people have called, let me tell you, people have definitely used that number and have reached out. And I'm really proud of that. And I hope to continue doing that work. And Mr. Soto, because you weren't in on this one, um, you know, the, we've got two Democratic lawmakers. Uh, by their accounts, they're doing great things for their constituency. Why should we change um, our representation in Legislative District 3? Oh, you mean cha change seats? Uh, uh, have somebody... Change you for one of them. <laughs> well, 
one thing that that I feel, uh, I mean, people are doing a great job in representing, you know, their constituents. Uh, I feel like myself, um, working class individuals, uh, construction workers are a little underrepresented at, at, at the table there. You know what I mean? We have so many different types of Democrats here in the House and not one actual labor person there. And I just want to be that kind of person to represent uh, construction type workers, working class families. Uh, that's, that's what I want. And I just want to quickly push back on that because I will speak on behalf of the 29 uh, Democrats that we have. We have tried, we have worked extremely hard to push the agendas forward. And it, it, to say that we're not doing, you know, that is, is inaccurate because our leadership within the Democratic Party and all of the members have really great ideas that get nowhere because we're in a Republican majority. So I just want people watching to know that it's not that we're not representing or doing the best that we can. We truly are trying our best, but under a Republican led majority, it is very hard to get anything done. Here's another one from the audience. Seems to dovetail nicely. Can you name one Republican member of the state legislature that you respect? I saw Alma laugh. So, so I'll, there. Well, I mean, I think a lot of <laughs> you know this. I, I run a group that is a bipartisan group, and I'm very proud of that. And I, we started that last year. We unofficially call it the Beer Caucus. Just out there, not everyone drinks when they're there. A lot of those folks just come and have conversations. And I'm really proud that we've had so many members show up over time. You know, I, I fully respect everyone, even if I don't agree with their issue, with, with what it is that they're saying, I, I truly try and have some respect for them. If I respect them, I hope the same, you know, to me um, as well. But I will say that I, there's one person that I truly respect, and that's Noel Campbell. And that's the co-chair of the Beer Caucus with me. And that is an individual who has been extremely, it's been an ex extremely pleasant time to work with him. He has not only been a colleague, but a true friend. And I just wanted to say that, and I don't know if he's watching or not, but he's someone that I can talk to on a daily basis or talk to him whenever I have a question. And I truly do admire him um, as a person. And we may not agree on every issue. Let me tell you, we don't. And he knows that, but we know that we can at least be cordial to each other and respect each other in our opinions. Rep Kano? You know, Hank, uh, this is a, a very sensitive topic for me because I think uh, ultimately what has been shown time and time again when over 700 bills in the last legislative session were uh, introduced and uh, only seven of those bills were Democratic bills that were heard by the Republican majority. Uh, I take really uh, a big issue with, um, you know, the issue of whether bipartisanship is truly something that is possible in the current makeup of the legislature. Uh, Arizonans elected a 31 Republican, 29 Democratic advantage in the 2018 elections. It's the closest split since we've had since the 1960s. And uh, my first opinion piece as a legislator focused on bipartisanship and coming together, I happen to think that I was just... Uh, ready to go into the legislature with rose-colored glasses of what the reality would be. Uh, and so, you know, I'm going to put a big to be decided on who my favorite Republican lawmaker is right now, Hank, because when we talk about the issues, when we talk about supporting unions, when we talk about supporting education, about addressing our transportation infrastructure, time and time again, you may have Republicans who say that they agree Agree with us, but when it comes down to voting for this legislation on the floor, uh, they don't stand with the Democrats. They don't stand with their party. They're afraid of the retribution that will come from the uh, Republican Speaker of the House. And so I don't play friends with them because for me, uh, I'm talking about constituents who need help back home. And um, and so yeah, it's a to be a TBA. Maybe maybe I'll have more hope. In I think it, it wasn't it wasn't who your favorite. I think it was who you respect. Just FYI. Both, both Representative Hernandez. Don't get me started. <laughs> I started going to those beer caucuses and then I was like, nope, I, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> and Mr. Soto, I realized not being a member of the legislature, you're, a bit, you're at a bit of a disadvantage here, but are there any Republican politicians, Arizonans or otherwise, that you respect or look up to? Not anyone in particular, but any Republican that can, uh, you know, reach across the line and see that, you know, and agree with anybody that, that, that helps working class families and I would respect. So there's no one actually in particular. 
We're getting close to the end of our time together. Um, let me give a quick look over what we've had come in from the audience. There we go. Here's a decent one. Speaking of prisons, do the candidates endorse removing bail for nonviolent offenders? Should we do away with bail for those who haven't committed a violent felonies? Well, I'll go ahead and start uh, that off, Hank. Uh, I think we need to look at all of the reforms, including bail reform, including sentencing reform, anything that we can do to reduce the population, uh, uh, the the prison population, one of the first things that I did as one of your representatives in uh, months two, three, and four of uh, last year was visit uh, our state prisons and be able to interact directly with uh, inmates, um, not just get the uh, department line of what was going on, right, when uh, a corrections official would try to take us into this, uh, you know, pre-sanitized, washed out version of, of what living in a cell is like or living in a pod, uh, I would ask, as some of the other colleagues who joined us, to go into a completely different off-the-script uh, building facility because that shows us the true example. And what we continue to face in Arizona is uh, a burgeoning prison system. This bail reform is absolutely needed, but more than anything, we haven't talked about health care for the inmates who are there. They are in our custody, and we've had left and right contracts, private contracts with medical facility, uh, medical providers that absolutely need our scrutiny. Uh, because when we were in those detention cells and we were hearing that folks hadn't gotten any kind of medical care for three or four weeks, when women in, uh, in our prisons today are still not able to get proper COVID testing, that's a problem. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to continuing the discussion and having uh, a democratic majority where we can discuss this on the Judiciary Committee and the Public Safety Committees. And I'll just add to that, there have been efforts around the country, and I'm sure many folks have already seen, of those organizations that are helping bail out women, especially in particular mothers who have been put behind bars, who unfortunately, you know the system, the system that has been created to fail many folks that look like me and many of the folks that look like those in my community. As probably one of the, I'm not sure, I, I don't know Mr. Soto very well, but as uh, from what I know, the only, the only legislator currently that has been through the system as someone who unfortunately was in a horrible situation as a teenager having to be put in a juvenile detention center for something I didn't do having to prove my innocence and fight the criminal justice system that is broken for over a year and a half to prove my innocence I will tell you that you are darn right that I'm going to be supporting anything that has to do with helping those who are in this situation that I was once in you know, being someone who didn't come from privilege that had to work extremely hard and depend on my parents to be able to help me get out of that horrible situation. I know what the school to prison pipeline looks like. I've seen it. If you look at the schools and the districts that we represent, unfortunately, we see a situation where many of our folks don't make it to college. They make it to our local, um, local jail or our state prisons. We need to stop that and we need to end that now. And I think there are many ways to do it when it comes to criminal justice reform. That is part of the reason why I ran for office. And I'm going to continue working on that front because it is something that's truly, truly personal to me. And I, you know, I, I, I am sometimes very disheartened when I hear and see those elected officials who truly don't care. And they say, well, if someone did something wrong, then, you know, that's their fault and they shouldn't deserve a second chance. Well, I disagree because I'm sitting here now with all of you as a state representative representing the district where I was born and raised, even after everything that I've gone through as a teenager. So I just want to tell those that are watching, if you have, and most of us, and let's be honest, most people here and most people out in the real world, including Republicans, have known someone or have been personally affected by the broken criminal justice system. And I just want people to acknowledge that. And Mr. Soto? Yeah, I feel like bail allows prisons to be used as warehouses for people who can't afford it. Um, depending on uh, the person's prior convictions, maybe, I, I don't think that it's necessary for minor misdemeanors for people to be, uh, uh, I don't think bail is necessary for those, those types of people. Okay. Um, all right, we are getting near the end. Uh, let me slip in the reporter's pet project question here. Um, should Democrats take over the majority in the House, how will you ensure that it runs more transparently for the public than it has under Republican administrations? Be specific. 
That's well, for God. starters, I told you earlier about the very sad reality that we have in the current makeup of our House of Representatives here in Arizona. Uh, the majority party refuses to give any kind of Democratic bills fair consideration. They use procedural maneuvers to say that they've heard our committees, when in reality, they heard our legislation, but they heard it in the final 48 hours of us convening and getting ready to adjourn for the rest of the session, as they did last week. Uh, I don't know if you read uh, the, those reports when we were back last week about um, our time uh, returning to the Capitol, and, and they were first reading all of the Democratic bills. It was really uh, quite something and quite sad. But look, Hank, um, Democrats are going to take over the majority in the 2020 election. We're going to have to be the adults in the room. We are going to have to do better than what the Republican majority has done. That includes giving legislation a fair process and fair consideration. It, it includes taking a deep look at all of the fiscal impacts the, that we are going to have as a result of COVID-19, having to come together and discuss all revenue options, put them on the table. It's the kind of red, uh, legislative leadership that I wish we would have had in these last two years with such a uh, near partisan split of lawmakers. Uh, unfortunately, we were never able to have, to have that kind of adult conversation. So I look forward to, to us just uh, leading by example for us uh, to be able to, to say we are here as One Arizona, one Arizona United. Uh, and, and I think, um, you know, it's, it's uh, of course, members of the Democratic Party are going to be the ones who are going to be leading by example. Uh, that's what Arizonans want. Uh, it's why we had such significant gains in the 2018 elections. And there is hope you can come together, but you have to have us at the table. And I'm looking forward to having one of those seats at the table again in 2020 and 2021 and beyond. I will, I will give you a few examples to that question. One of the things that we could start by doing immediately is making sure that we have an open process whenever we are discussing bills, whenever we're working on budget issues, that we bring in members of the public and we bring in stakeholders to participate in that. There is no reason why our community should be shut out of those conversations. There is absolutely zero reason for that. Second, I think it's very important for us to be able to post agendas and not surprise folks on what bills we're going to be voting on. I think everyone should have access to everything that we know immediately. If we know we're going to be voting on these bills, that should be put out immediately and not surprise people on the fly. I think that's one of the big mistakes that we've made. It has not been transparent. Yes, we live stream, but it's very different for those folks who are depending on what they're seeing online to know what's going to happen. Things are very fluid at the Capitol. I think the majority of folks know that everything will change in a matter of minutes. But we can do our very best to ensure that we're not having people search and search to be able to find that information. Also, I think it's very important that we have members of the press and that they have access all the time. There is no reason why reporters and, and anyone from the TV come in. There's no reason why we shouldn't allow them in. They should always be allowed and be a part of the convert, be in, in the room where we're having these conversations so that the members of the public know what's truly going on. And that's the only way a lot of folks in the, in the public know what's going on is by keeping up with our reporters, keeping up with all of that. So I just want to say those are the top three things that I think we can do to be able to be more transparent at the Capitol, be able to be more inclusive of bringing everyone in and not just a, a, folks, a group of folks who always do the decision making. You could, I, I couldn't agree more, and, and I, I don't think I can even add to, to what was just said. Okay, well then, we have hit an hour and a half. Um, I, I want to give you guys a few minutes to speak directly to the voters um, and kind of give your closing comments. Uh, so I believe we started with Mr. Cano and ended with uh, Mr. Soto in the opening remarks. Let's go in the opposite order. Well, one thing that I do as, as an organizer is uh, I help electricians, you know, in my field, you know, uh, get uh, better wages, better benefits. Uh, I go out there, I hunt them down. What we do, we help people who are striking our constituents from, from ASARCO, the striking miners. Um, and I'd like to do that for all of Arizona. I'd like to help people out. Representative Hernandez. All right, sorry. this is our closing statement, right? Yeah. 
Okay, perfect. So I just want to first and foremost, thank everyone who joined us tonight and thank everyone who is participating. This is great to be able to have this open dialogue. I want to start off by thanking all of my supporters and those who helped me get elected the first time. It was an uphill battle, but I am very proud to be able to serve the district where I was born and raised. I'm proud to be endorsed not only by unions, but also by the firefighters, healthcare organizations, those who truly believe in my mission to be able to move our state forward. I plan to be able to return next year and work on the legislation that didn't quite make it all the way. And I plan to be able to contribute and bring new ideas and innovative ways to move our state forward, especially during the pandemic. I hope to gain the support of those who have voted for me in the past. I hope that you will consider voting for me once again. And I hope to continue making those proud that I'm serving at the legislature. Visit almaforarizona.org um, to get in contact with my campaign. We're constantly looking for volunteers. We have a wonderful group of supporters already. So I hope to continue being your legislator at the Capitol. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you so much, uh, Hank, and to the Clean Elections Commission, as well as uh, my colleagues, Mr. Soto and Representative Hernandez. It's an honor to share this virtual uh, stage with you tonight. And to the folks walking, uh, watching at home, uh, I hope that you and your loved ones are staying safe during these uncertain times. I'm one of your tested and seasoned lawmakers, and over the last year and a half, as you have elected me to be one of your representatives, I'd say uh, the biggest opportunity that I've had in this lifetime is to be your state representative. I'm 28 years old. I was raised by a single mom in public housing, and for me, this district where I was born and raised is the community that I love, and it's our neighbors who need our help and who need representative leadership to continue uh, fighting for working families, for a strong education system, for a K-12 system that actually works, a criminal justice system that's protected, and an environment that needs our help. Uh, I'm so proud to be on the August 4th ballot because so many of you believe in this vision of a new chapter for Arizona. And for me, you know, public service is not about uh, any one individual person. It is so much stronger when we talk about our public service and our representative leadership as we, as us. Uh, those are the tenets uh, of my campaign. It's why I ran for office, because I was sick and tired of all of those folks at the Capitol not being reflective or representative of the people who are in our state. Uh, our legislature can do better. I want us to continue doing better. And that's why I'm running for re-election to the State House of Representatives. I am so proud to be endorsed by all uh, of the organizations that mean so much to us, uh, organizations like Planned Parenthood, the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, Run for Something, the Victory Fund. I happen to be Arizona's youngest LGBT legislator. There are so many constituencies that helped get me here in 2018. And in 2020, I'm asking for you to continue allowing us to continue that work at the state capitol uh, because I believe in us uh, and I ask that you believe in me. For more information, you can visit my website at andresforarizona.com. Uh, please volunteer with us. Please donate what whatever you can to help make sure that we get our message out uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks. We're just about seven weeks out, uh, 70 days out from the primary election. Please sign up by mail to vote. That is super important. We've not talked about the importance of voting by mail during a public health epidemic. Um, and for me, I'm just super excited about continuing to uh, be one of your legislators up at the state capitol. Thanks for your time and thanks for a great conversation. And as always, my cell phone number is 520-301-6162 if you need me. That's it. Thank you three so much for being here. Um, thank you to all the voters uh, who took the time to watch this debate and inform themselves before the August 4th primary election. The Citizens Clean Elections Commission is your source for nonpartisan voter information. We encourage you to visit azcleanelections.gov for all your voting needs. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Good luck.